Right. Well, hello, everybody. It's really nice to be back. I'm very pleased to have been here yesterday. I thought it was a really very stimulating morning, stimulating day. Um, I think you all know now I'm Gary Alexander. Um, some of you know my book. I've got a few copies if other people want it. Um, and um, I've just retired from the Open University where I was working for 37 years and I was one of the people who put the Open University courses online. So online communications is, was my main field. Um, and now I've been working on community projects in DIS in Norfolk where I live and um, I'll be talking a bit about that later on as examples. What I'm hoping to do is to give the, the big picture here as, as I see it. Um, what are we looking for in this project? Well, this was from the, the blurb, the, the preliminary version. So it's what the question really is, what is emergent sustainability? What could it mean? And uh, how might we get there? <laughs> Jingle bells. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'm going to start by a sort of quick romp through evolutionary history, which will give us a sense of, well, the creatures that were sustainable over maybe billions of years, and what were the emergent properties, and what do we get out of that? As you can see, it will start with most primitive and end up with future possibilities for emergent sustainability um, around the globe. So the first life, which... Uh, started about four billion years ago was, well, what became what primitive bacteria. Uh, cells without a nucleus, just a set of chemicals really that were um, sort of chains of reactions. The first life um, more or less consisted of molecules that reacted with, with results which c continued in to, to a closed chain until they came back to the starting point, wrapped in a membrane so the whole thing stayed together. And so here was an emergent wholeness, the first life, and that is still the fundamental basis of, of all life today. The key point about it is that it was a set of parts that are mutually reinforcing to create something new that's whole. That's the, the, the first lesson. That, this parts that create a wholeness is what is the, 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 whole, the overall theme that we're looking for. First complex cells, cells with nuclei, with the, the cells that we're all made of came only a billion years ago, so it was only bacteria for the first three billion years. Here, these cells have a nucleus. Most of the DNA has moved to the center now. Now, the biologists think that complex cells arose from colonies of bacteria. So, for example, it may be that um, parasites came in within one other bacteria and stayed and became symbiotic, or maybe they, they ate others and they didn't get digested, they remained. Anyway, so you, you gradually got this emergent wholeness at an, a, a larger level. And again, lots of parts forming a new whole, collaborating, whereas perhaps there was a little bit of an ecosystem and competition before. So it's competition turning into collaboration is, the again, the overall theme. That's really what we're looking for. Separation forming a new whole. Moving on um, to us and our friends. Um, multicellular organisms. Now this is much more recent, only half a billion years ago, the beginning, the early Cambrian explosion. And um, now we've got creatures that are made of vast numbers of these complex cells. Um, specialized tissues of similar cells um, working together. The trick was that although they shared the same DNA, only some of that DNA was switched on and off at any one time. So a bone cell is very different from a blood cell that shares the same DNA, but some of the DNA in the blood cell is different, is, is switched on, and different DNA is switched on in the bone cell. This is a very complex collaboration. And by this point, you're getting all sorts of mechanisms for coordination, self-regulation, and things which create a wholeness from these separate parts. And so when we're talking about the social sustainability, we're going to be looking for what are these mechanisms 
and we're going to be abstracting really from an organism. I think some of us can see where this is going to lead to. Anyway, so from multicellular organisms, where do we go next? Well, groups? Uh, not quite, I don't think. Not my sense of it. Um, maybe um, the social insects are, you know, a swarm of bees maybe is a sort of emergent homeless. Maybe, but it's not, certainly not animals and um, I don't think us. Anyway, so, but you can see where we're pointing. The next level of wholeness, a sustainable Earth as a whole planet, functioning as an organism. That's the message. That's what I think. Um, I don't know if you know uh, Peter Russell and his books. He's been talking about this since the 1970s. So this is, this is what I think is, is really, it's either, the, either this emergent wholeness at the planetary scale or um, disaster at the worst, gl runaway global warming leading to mass extinction. Anyway, other words for it, maybe planetary citizenship, and I looked on the internet for interesting images and um, things like this or that. I steal images very freely. And um, that one's mine. That's the, from the cover of my book. The, the idea being there's um, humanity is forming a nervous system for an Earth functioning as an organism. So again, we're collaborating for the well-being instead of being in global competition. That's the, that's, to me, that's the big picture. So, just a sort of first look, it means at the local scale, the cell equivalent, is connected communities or something functioning like that. Local communities working together for mutual support and then linked up in large-scale networks at various scales. And the question is, how do these happen? What are their properties? What are they going to be like? Anyway, brief pause for a moment. Have I lost you? Is this madness? <laughs> what do you think? I mean, just as a first thing. Uh, number one, who, many, who thinks this is uh, just <laughs> right here? Anyway, yeah, it's all right, yes. Uh, whoop, hang on, I didn't. I, I wanted to get the rest of that. Who thinks, yeah, OK, but it's just Beyond the pale. Anyway, I think it's possible, but it's a long shot. That's, I'm, I'm not much beyond that myself. Um, yes, and it's beginning to happen. I'm sort of between, personally, between three and four, I would say, myself. Um, and then five is, is just it's inevitable. It's going to happen. This is the way of, no. OK, so we're, sort of, we're mostly between three and three and four, are we? Yeah, well, that's OK. Right, so how is this going to happen? Um, m m favorite metaphor, I can't remember where I got it from. It was not my original, mine originally. Metamorphosis. A caterpillar is very different from a butterfly, and yet one changes into the other. How could we get from a caterpillar-like stage to butterfly-like stage? So a caterpillar is an eating machine. It's a very simple creature. All it does is eat and eat and eat and eat. And eat. You know, the parallels between our, that and global humanity is very clear. Um, it goes into, creates a cocoon when it's reached its limits, and we have reached our limits of the earth, and um, it's the limits of the earth which are that cocoon for, for us, for this transformation stage. Now what happens inside that pupa is that the, the body of the caterpillar, which has gathered all this food over its brief lifetime, starts to break down. And I think uh, that's what's happening in society now. And this past year in particular, it's really coming up and it's very clear. Now, the thing is, at that point, the butterfly begins to grow using the raw material that the, ca the, ca the caterpillar has assembled from what are the biologists called imaginal disks, little spots on its body. Um, I imagine like this with a breasts of, an, of a child growing, a young girl growing into breasts or whatever. And there are little spots for the legs and the wings and the antennae and, and all that. Completely different from the caterpillar. They start growing. But this is under hormonal control. It's evolved over millions of years or whatever. With us, 
we got one chance and we haven't got any experience about how to do it. We're going to have to figure it out on our own. It's very, quite different. But anyway, the result is a butterfly which is completely different from a caterpillar. They're just vastly different creatures. So, and we should be expecting that our sustainable society will be vastly different. It's not business as usual, but a bit more carbon trading and low energy light bulbs. It's not going to be like that. If, it's going to, if it happens, if it's successful, it's going to be completely different. And, you know, try to imagine what a collaborative world could be like. Humanity looking after the planet. So, for us, what are the imaginal disks? What are the equivalent? Well, there's loads and loads. Transition towns, I think, are brilliant. Um, I launched my book at the Earth Summit in Johannesburg in 2002, and there were 30,000 people there uh, from all sorts of NGOs around the world who were so inspiring um, as compared to the 3,000 from the world governments. Anyway, there's just vast numbers of organizations. It's just a very small selection and a quick search on the internet. Let's fill it up. Fill up the screen. Okay. But there's a problem. You, know, you talk to these organizations. They're concerned with their own little issues, and they're great at whatever it is they're doing, but they are not looking at this overall picture. Now, when we are academics looking at emerging sustainability from the point of view of complexity theory, we are looking at this big picture. And uh, that's really, really the key. That is the challenge. There's lots of stuff. There's the imaginal disks, but where is the hole? The hole is still yet to come. Anyway, so what would a sustainable Earth look like? That's the question. Move, do something. Right. Is there anything? Wasn't there anything there? No. Oh well. Okay. Um, now, what's happened? There's some, something's gone wrong. There should be three sub things here which I've, I've missed. I, what I was going to talk about is the structure of this, um, then the metabolism. The, 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 the structure we'll see is going to be a sort of viable systems model. The metabolism is a collaborative economy, and then the nervous system, which is the connectivity, the communication system. Quick romp through all of those. <coughs> I don't know what happened to those bits. Anyway, I think now, early 21st century, we've got a pretty good idea of what it is we don't want. I mean, the majority rules democracy is a hell of a lot better than your oppressive hierarchy, than your feudal system or your dictatorship, but it's still only a small step up. And then there was the, the sort of cooperative, hippie alternative in the last century. A lot of us know how difficult that can be. We need something a lot more sophisticated now. We need some kind of a general framework. And the, the only really readable book about this that I know of is from my, my good friend John, sitting right there. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> like the rest of my book. <laughs> 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 right, so Stafford Beer's Viable Systems Model. Um, I see it as, a, as a, a very general framework, a way of thinking. And it's partly that he's abstracted it from a functioning organism um, and put, made that on the, on the social scale. So it, is, it, is, it follows from the first part of my talk very, very clearly. And it's applicable at many scales, and it is scale. I mean, a large-scale viable systems model has components which are smaller-scale viable systems models, and, and so on down. So at the lowest level, you've got a human, which is a viable systems model as well. Um, right, so... The structure, um, and John has talked about this quite a bit yesterday, so I can go quickly. The, the operational units, the things which actually do the work, you want them to be as autonomous as, as possible uh, and given control of their own decision making. And then you add to that this meta system. I'll say a, a bit more about this very quickly because and John has gone through it. Uh, I've interpreted this fairly loosely. I think policy, I take more as, also as identity sense of connection. Um, you are part, you're, you're not just an individual, you are part of this global planetary citizenship type thing and you base your policy on that. And what this means is people beginning to see themselves as part of 
this larger whole, the local group looking after itself, the planetary, the citizenship looking, working for the Earth. Right. And the second one is synergy, which is the operational units no, no longer working in isolation, but coordinating their efforts to best effect and allocating resources appropriately. Now, the theme that begins to emerge, they need the information about each other. Information is actually the, the key to, the, to, to this creating this wholeness. So it may be your um, open source software might be really crucial and that sort of thing. The third function is balance with the external environment. Again, the key part of that is getting the information that you need to do it. And then, I mean, I've done this in a different order from standard VSM, but anyway. Um, this one I think is most, probably the most important of all, knowing that there, are, there is a problem and setting up systems to correct it. Problems occur all, around, all along. Any organism has to be able to repair itself, has to routinely be able to handle things that go wrong. First thing you need is information systems which let you know that that's the case. It's not, it's not frightening that things go wrong. If, if we're talking about social systems, the most important thing there is conflicts between people. Well-meaning people just see things differently and diverge. So you have to have, a, as a matter of routine, ways of handling this. And that means that in this new global sustainable community, skills of communication so that people come to understand each other are the most important social skill and means of handling conflicts one way or another. I think, again, Don's been talking about this a lot. And there is a lot, of, it's not routine in most organizations, but there is a lot of skill and a lot of people who know how to handle things like this. Nonviolent communication, various movements, which restorative justice, which are really very exciting. Right, so that's a bit about the structure, the viable systems model applied to the structure. Next bit is the metabolism. How is this thing going to function? And this is, applies equally at the very local level, the local communities, and at larger scales, starting with the local communities. And you know, the first thing is, why do you do things? Why do you make things? Why do you offer things? What's the motivation for it? And for the right reasons, the well-being of people and planet, as opposed to why do we do things now, in the mainstream, because we have to make money. That is, this is I'm not going to go into my usual big money rant, just a little taste of it. But you want an economy that's driven by what matters. And you're setting up a cybernetic system to handle it. Not doing things indirectly for money so that mad things like cutting down rainforests for a short-term gain make sense. Or all the things you hear on the news, the madness is going because we're not doing things for the right reasons. We're doing things in this, for money, which is a completely arbitrary concept. It's not about monetary reform. It's way beyond that. Anyway. That was a bit of my money rant. Um, as an example, this is, this is an excellent book by Colin Tudge, very respected writer of uh, researcher on food. Feeding people is easy. And what he means by that is that it's easy to feed the whole world's population. There's plenty of food. That isn't, that isn't the issue. Uh, if you have a food system which is designed for the purpose, that's what its purpose is, and look after, looking after the, the land as opposed to what we do have, which is a food system which is designed to make the most money. So all the madnesses are, make sense because it's sensible to have supermarkets which make more money. They make more money than, the, than these funny little farmer's markets. But it's not optimum for social and uh, environmental well-being. Um, Colin Tudge's maxim is plenty of plants, not much meat, and maximum variety. So you don't have, uh, you use your animals, for example, you have um, chickens and, uh, and pigs that live on scraps, and you have grazing animals that live on marginal land. Not, you don't feed your animals on grain, which competes with the rest of human food. That would be a food system designed to provide food for people, not to provide best, most profits. Okay, so anyway, back to the collaborative economy. Competition becomes collaboration. Well, this is major difference, and we'll have to start very local. What it means, for example, is that organizations providing similar services find niches, maybe territories, 
maybe slightly different markets or whatever, so that they can end up collaborating instead of competing. And they're then free to support each other. They're not at war with each other, with each other anymore. And the combination of that, finding niches for different organizations and doing things for the right reasons, eases up so many things. Then it becomes reasonable to have things which last for a long time and are repairable and recyclable because you're not concerned. Uh, why, are, why can't we do this now? Because it doesn't, it's not the way to make money. Not because it's not desirable. Um, you can have local pr production tailored to needs. So that the power is much more even. Um, you don't need to promote consumption. Why do we promote consumption? Here, advertise. Want more, want more, please. It's madness. Only if you think that the reason for doing things is well-being rather than money. And if we can get past all these things, then there's a vast increase in efficiency because it does, takes much less effort to do what we need. And under those circumstances, for example, then our energy needs would be easily supplied by renewables. And global warming would go away. It wouldn't be an issue. It's not that we need this vast amount of energy. We don't. It's just that we have this crazy economy in the middle that isn't there to create well-being. Anyway, okay, what next? Um, so, if you haven't got competition to guide quality, people say without competition you wouldn't have quality control. What do you have? Well, you have a cybernetic system, quality guided by information, real costs. What is the real cost of this consumption? The environmental and the social costs of it. You get feedback systematically from producers, from consumers to producers, peer review, rather than fear, which is now supposedly what's Maintain the quality, but it doesn't actually. And if you've got the cybernetic system, you don't need central regulation. Um, very briefly, very beginnings of an attempt. We're trying to do this in, in, in DIS, but we're in a very early stage, I would say, hardly started. But the theory, the plan is to be working groups providing things for the people who are interested, um, whatever the people, whatever people want and a coordinating group or something or functions which has the viable systems model functions. Transition towns are doing this sort of thing. And I, I went to the transition town conference in, national conference in April and talked about how do you put this, the coordination on these separate groups? How do you turn this into a viable systems model? And I think they're, a lot of people there who are seeing the, the, the importance of that. But that's not there yet. But the final thing is this business of coordination. We need a nervous system for this emerging global organism. So that's what's going to create the wholeness. That's what's going to be the infrastructure for the linking. The wholeness is going to be in people's minds. The internet is not that yet. Though there are the beginnings of the possibilities, it's a sort of pre-adapted mechanism which we can create. But I don't think it's going to happen automatically. I think we're going to have to do it rather deliberately. So a sort of community-based set of social networking sites and trading sites based on trust, not based on, not, not linking strangers. So I think the, the, the system is obvious you, you want, it's, it's local building up to global. The local is the, the heart of it, um, which with feeds to, the, to each other and exactly how that will happen, we still will need to know. I think one of the key functions is what the, the geeks call persistent identity, single identity, which is available on many sites, which would function as, you, as your planetary citizenship identification, a sense of identity. Um, the facilities, which we were sort of vaguely talking about yesterday, um, the most important is good discussion, but with facilities to promote agreement. Coming, good discussion, bad discussions on the internet are very, very common. Um, 
We've got ideas about that, but we haven't actually got that far in our, our work. Um, support for groups. And this is sort of the group page on our disconnected website. Anybody can support, can create their own group. And um, it's got the members, it's got, uh, they can create as much content as they want. Anybody can edit the content. They can have private content or public content. Um, we've got a primitive, well, you can send email, but we haven't got a proper discussion system yet. But they can, anybody can, any group can create its own events, which are broadcast and it's news. Um, lots of other things which can either be private to their group or, or public. Um, but then the, the extra and the, the other main thing I think is vital is exchange. So that this communication supports the new metabolism, the, the collaborative community. And so this is, we're, again, it's very, very primitive at this point. We've got, we just have listings and we're still a lot more to do. But with a significant emphasis on free exchange. So we begin to loosen things up, up people's ideas about money. It's exchange within a defined group, free exchange within a defined group. And also money, monetary trade, but constrained by recommendations and, and reviews and ratings. So that quality can take, take over. And as an option, local currencies, although I've, we haven't got that far yet. Um, so this is the front page of our system. I'm running low on time. I don't think, uh, if, we, if there is time later, I can show you around that. But uh, you can see the, the content. Any, if anybody puts an image, it appears on the front page. If anybody puts up an article, it appears on the front page. You can, any group puts up their own events, it appears on the front page. And there's also listings from the, and, 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 and other things. So the front page is a reflection of what's going on for the whole community. And the idea being that because there's so much different stuff, what's going on, what, what, what people are doing, trading, local food. We hope that this will be a place that people will come to on a regular basis. We're trying to attract people, to give them a reason for, for going here regularly. Taste of Dis is our food festival coming up this coming weekend, so I was a bit squeezing myself to come here, but this seems so good. Um, right, and what's the status of this? Well, we started with Plone, which is not the same starting point you have. We, we considered Drupal and we decided that Plone was going to be actually the right thing for various sort of deeper technical reasons. Um, we had grant funding and we did a moderate amount of development to the point where I've just shown you, particularly on the groups and on the front page. Um, but then we had funding problems, sort of bringing up the conflict resolution bit personally in my life. And uh, development stopped, but we have actually got an active team working on the social side, which is really very exciting. And as of last week, I've got the beginnings of a new technical team, including one of the core developers of Plome. So development should actually take off and be really rapid now. So we're expecting that most of our specification will be finished by the end of this year. And that's about it. Okay. <laughs> Two or three minutes for questions, maybe?